Okay, thank you, uh, thank you, Bruce, very much for that lovely introduction, and thank you all for being here today uh, at, at this lunch. It's really a pleasure for me to have this chance to speak to all of you, um, and, and in part it's because it's really fun to be speaking to a women's organization. Like Bruce said, I'm a, an alumna of a women's college, and so it's kind of a, like going back home to my alma mater again, being here speaking with all of you. So. Um, as Bruce said, I came to Cold Spring Harbor Lab almost exactly four years ago. And uh, it, it's funny because in a in the few weeks after I arrived, I attended a new faculty luncheon that was hosted by Bruce and Grace Stillman uh, that was here on this very lawn. And so attending this lunch today has given me a chance to kind of look back on that time and has reminded me how much my science has evolved in these last four years and the time that I've been here. I came to Cold Spring Harbor four years ago because I wanted to be a part of the really groundbreaking neuroscience research that's happening here. And I was impressed both, both by the innovative experimental designs and experimental techniques that people were using, but also by the innovative spirit that's here at Cold Spring Harbor that makes it unlike any other institution and makes it possible to do science that really couldn't be done elsewhere and that truly has the potential to change the way that people think about the key problems in neuroscience. And at this moment now, right now, this moment in time is, I think, a perfect time to be doing that because that problem, thinking about how the brain works, is I think one of the key scientific challenges of the 21st century. And I say that for a few reasons. The first reason is that understanding how the brain works is the only way that we are going to make the progress that we need to in terms of understanding mental illness. And I probably don't have to, to work hard to convince you that mental illness is a huge, huge problem in our society. So for example, one in 100 people suffers from schizophrenia. And that's an absolutely devastating disorder that hits people in the prime of their young lives. Uh, in 2002, one in 68 children born will be diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder, which is a huge number of children and poses a huge problem, of course, for those individuals themselves, but also for the people who are caring for them. And finally, so I've told you one in 100 for schizophrenia, one in 68 for autism spectrum disorder, one in 10 women will suffer from an instance of major depression in their lifetime. One in 10 women. And I think it's important to say these numbers because although a lot of us know that mental illness is a problem, most of us know someone or have even suffered ourselves, it's something that often people don't really feel comfortable talking about. And so the, the prevalence of the problem is sometimes underappreciated. But those numbers mean that collectively it's, it's a huge problem and takes a huge toll on all of us, mostly in a personal sense, uh, in as much as if you are suffering yourself or caring for somebody who is, it's a tremendous personal loss or personal burden. But also, from a financial point of view, the cost of mental illness is absolutely enormous. So Tom Insel, who's the head of the National Institute for Mental Health uh, at, at, the, at the NIH, um, estimates that the U.S. spends about $57.7 billion every year in treating mental illness. And actually, that's really probably a great underestimate because there's a lot, uh, there's a much greater, or not greater, but uh, additional financial burden um, from the fact that people who are suffering from mental illness often can't work. So they are, can't contribute to society in the way that they would normally um, if they were well or if they were treated. So the, the cost is truly huge. And the disorders that I've highlighted just now are ones that we would call mental disorders, but there are a, a whole host of other brain disorders that are equally devastating that are disorders of the motor system. So for example, Huntington's, Parkington, Parkinson's, ALS, uh, a, various ataxias um, can be equally devastating compared to those, uh, in, in addition to those other disorders. Uh, and perhaps uniquely so because people suffering from, from motor disorders are often cognitively spared. And so they know exactly what's happening and it can be very, um, be very devastating. So on the treatment side, it's, it's fortunate to be able to say that the treatment for a lot of these disorders has improved dramatically in the last 100 years. The way that we treat mental illness has come a long, long way compared to 100 years ago. We now have uh, uh, therapies, behavioral therapies, cognitive therapies, medications, different kinds of ways that we can treat mental illness. And also some of the stigma has been removed. So we've really made a lot of progress so far, but it, it isn't enough. Even though clinicians are working very hard to treat these disorders and to come up with new remedies, they're still, they still persist. And the treatments 
often are not complete. They don't allow people suffering to lead completely normal lives, or they might not work for everybody. There are depression medications that are very effective for some sufferers, but don't work at all for other sufferers. And for another group, cause side effects that are so intolerable that they, they aren't able to take them anymore. So even though we've begun uh, to make progress, there's still a long, long way to go. And you might wonder, well, why is it so hard to treat these disorders? Right? I mean, medical, uh, the field of medicine has made lots of progress in treating other kinds of diseases. For example, there are childhood diseases like, uh, like pertussis or, or measles, which used to be routine childhood diseases, which killed lots of children, which are now mostly gone thanks to vaccines. And if you get something simple like conjunctivitis, you can go to the doctor, you get antibiotics, it's gone in six hours. So why, you know, why is it so difficult to treat mental disorders? And I think there's a, a few reasons. So the first one is that brains are just very, very complex. So your brain uh, is comprised of many, many neurons. Those are the special cells that are unique to, to the central nervous system. And you have in your head about 70 billion neurons. Each of those neurons make con connections with many, many other neurons, as many as 10,000 or sometimes even 100,000. So that means that your brain has 100 trillion connections inside of it, which are important for doing all of the things that you do, speaking and moving around and thinking and so on. And these connections are made with these long, thin processes called axons, which go start at one neuron and go way out and allow it to communicate electro electrically with many other neurons. And if we took all of the axons in your brain and we just laid them all out, one next to the other, one next to the other, it would go 176,000 kilometers long. And that is long enough to go around the circumference of the Earth of about four and a half times. And that's in the brain of one person. So the brain is really staggeringly complex. And so the problem of trying to understand how all of those neurons work together and how all of those connections give rise to thinking and movement and language is a really complicated thing. So that's the first problem. The second problem is that brains are unique. Each brain is very different from every other brain. And that's true to a much greater extent than it is with other organs in the body like the kidney or the liver. And even if you have two people who are identical twins, and suppose one of them has autism and one of them does not, which happens sometimes, although there is a large genetic component to autism, and you looked at each of their brains using a number of different techniques, well, you would find all kinds of enormous differences between those two brains, even of identical twins, and some of those would be related to the autism, and some of them wouldn't, because even individuals with the same genetic background have very different brains. The experiences that we have shape our brains, and one person is very different from the next. So you can imagine that if we don't have many sets of identical twins and we're trying to understand different disorders, looking across the population, the brains of one person to the next differ just incredibly. And so trying to understand which of those differences give rise to disorders and disease and which are the differences that just make that person unique is very, very difficult to do. Okay, the, the third reason this is a, a challenging problem is that brains change throughout our lives. They change massively during development. This is especially true very early in development. When a baby's first born, it can't even move. It can't even reach up to, to hit something hanging from its crib. And then a year later, they're beginning to learn to walk and move and eventually learning to talk. And uh, mostly, we get better at things. So mostly, development serves to, to help us to improve. Sometimes, of course, especially because of aging, there are things that we get worse at. In fact, if you think of the, uh, the, memory, the card game, the memory game, you know, where you're flipping over the cards to find the two different matching ones, I think uh, the, that even people in their late 20s have had the experience of being humbled by a six-year-old who has superior spatial memory and is able to beat them at memory. So some of those changes are because um, uh, changes and are inevitable as part of aging. But sometimes our brains actually get worse at things on purpose. So a really interesting example of that is to think about how language is acquired. When babies are born, they're able to distinguish sounds in every different language. So for example, a baby born into an American household with English-speaking parents, when it's first born, is able to distinguish sounds that aren't relevant in English at all, but that are very relevant in, for example, Chinese. As time goes by, by the time the baby is about nine months old, so not really very old, they can't tell the difference anymore. So sounds in Chinese that they used to be able to distinguish, they can't distinguish them anymore. And that's because if you're a baby growing up in an English-speaking household, those particular distinctions aren't relevant. 
So the brain kind of gets worse at those distinctions so that it can get better at the distinctions that don't really matter. So because of all these changes, the brains are, are, we can't think of them as being a stationary thing at all. Our brains are changing all of the time, and this continues into adulthood. And I think that's one of the things that, especially in the last decade, that neuroscience has really taught us. The brains continue to change even after people have reached maturity and are capable of tremendous plasticity, especially when presented with the right kinds of input. Adult brains can continue to change and grow and develop in, in really interesting ways that are becoming more and more appreciated. So that was the third challenge to understanding the brain, which is that brains change massively throughout development. And I think there's a final reason why it's been so difficult to treat uh, mental disorders, and that's because there are many, many aspects of brain function that we still really don't understand. And I want to have a couple of examples of that that are from the visual system, which is the part of the brain that I work on. I'm interested in, in visual processing and especially how a visual uh, visual inputs are combined with auditory ones. So to highlight for you what I mean, one of the sort of mysteries of the brain, kind of look around the room for a minute and kind of take note whether you, whether you encounter any kind of gaps in your visual field, whether, where there, whether there are any places that look kind of like a hole in your visual scene. And if you have normal vision, most people will probably report uh, nope, you know, world looks pretty complete to me, you know, things look good. Um, but what I hope to convince you of now is that actually your visual field has some pretty large gaps in it. All of us have these gaps, but that probably you've never noticed them before. Okay, so in order to do that, we're going to do um, an experiment. We're going to do a behavioral experiment. I think I might be breaking new ground in terms of the women's lunch in here, actually doing science at the lunch, but that's okay. Okay, so everybody, if you look in your program, you have a little card that has two visual illusions on it. Does everybody have their card? So you can fold it in half and just look at the top part first with the big gray rectangle. And this is going to show you how to find your blind spot. We each have uh, one blind spot in each eye. So what you're going to do is cover your left eye and look at the cross. So you're going to be looking out of your right eye and then hold the card way out at arm's length so your arm is far away. And then slowly keep looking at the cross and bring the card closer and closer to your eye and you will notice at a certain point that the black spot disappears. Okay, so hopefully everybody experienced the illusion. And I hope you can see now that even though when you look around that the world seems like it's complete, that actually there's a blind spot. And of course, you have one in the other eye too. And probably you never noticed it before. Re remember too that this has nothing to do with bad vision. Everybody has this. Um, it, it's basically the, the part where your optic nerve, which is the, the, um, the relay wires that go from your eye to the brain, it's the place where your optic nerve meets your retina. And the retina is the part of your eye that actually does the business of seeing. And that optic nerve has to hook up somewhere. And the place where it hooks up, just no light can get through. So there's just a place where no light can get through. And that's called your blind spot. And you just can't see. And I want to point out that this, is, this highlights how your eye is really very, very different from a digital camera. Or if we have any traditionalists in the audience, it's even different from a regular camera. Which is that suppose you had a pixel on your digital camera on your phone that's burnt out. Or suppose in the traditional equivalent, you have a mark on the lens of your camera. Well, if you take a picture and look at the picture, there's just a black hole in the middle of the picture because no light came through because there weren't any pixels there. But your eye is not like that. Your eye and your brain are not a digital camera. They don't just pass the light through faithfully and report what happened. They interpret it. So a big part of what happens in vision happens not just in terms of faithfully processing the light, but in interpreting that signal in your brain. And so even though there's a part of the visual field that you just realized was missing, your brain fills it in. And none of us really ever notice that we have a blind spot at all until you set things up with this configuration so that you can see it. And so the, the other illusion that's on your card, if you look at the other side, um, will make the same point. So if, if you look at the two squares, there's one labeled with an A and there's one labeled with a B. 
And if I ask you, how many people think that B is lighter than A, most people would probably raise their hands because it looks very much lighter. But in fact, the luminance of those two squares is identical. The light hitting your eyes from those two squares is exactly the same. And at this point, there's usually somebody who will say, now, wait a second, I think there was a mistake at the printer. And in this actual case, it, they're not the same, but they really are. If you don't believe me, you can take a pencil and poke a little, some little holes in the envelope that your name card came in and have two little holes uh, so that they can peek through. And you'll see that A and B are exactly the same color. All right, I can tell you guys really like doing science. I should uh, try to be recruiting volunteers for my lab at this lunch. <laughs> and so again, I think this illusion, <laughs> too, too much enthusiasm about science. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. The skeptics in the audience can start to um, come up with ways to, to test to see if they really are the same luminance. And I know it's shocking to see, but they really, really are. And again, this, it, this illusion is like the other one in that it doesn't really matter what actually happened in the world. Your brain changes things by its interpretation. And in this particular case, the fact that there's this tall green cylinder here makes your brain infer that there ought to be a shadow there. And so your brain says, well, if there's a shadow there, even though it looks, uh, if, if it looks like it's light, it must actually be dark. And so it ends up looking very different from the other square, even though the absolute luminance of these two is completely um, identical. And so this should, should kind of give you pause, I think. We hear people say a lot, well, you know, I saw it with my own eyes. And that usually is kind of ground truth. If you saw it with your own eyes, well, it actually happened. But I think, you know, what I've hoped to convince you of with this, these illusions is that if you, if you see something with your own eyes, it isn't necessarily enough. Our eyes fool us all the time because our brain interprets the inf incoming information uh, in many, many different ways. And this illusion is kind of close to my heart um, because it's related a bit to the kind of work in, that we do in my lab. In my lab, we're interested in how brains make decisions about incoming sensory stimuli, and especially stimuli that are ambiguous and unreliable. We make them difficult, for, difficult to judge, and this invites uh, the brain to integrate information across time and across sensory modalities to make a better decision. And one of the challenges that we face, and I'll tell you more about this in a moment, is that we do these experiments not only in humans, where we can give instructions like hold the card out, move it in, um, but also in rodents, where we can't give them verbal instructions and have to come up with, uh, with other ways to get the point across to them. So I've started off telling you that the, one of the key scientific challenges of the 21st century is understanding brain function, both in its normal and disrupted state. And what I've tried to tell you in the last few minutes is the reason why that is. And one main reason is, of course, that it will help us to treat mental disorders. But a second reason is because science, neuroscience is really just a fascinating problem. And illusions like this will perhaps help you realize why those of us in the field came into the field, because there's all kinds of fascinating things that our brain does that we really don't understand very well. So. What are we going to do to solve this problem? So it's a big problem that we don't understand how well enough how the brain works. And that's really where basic science comes in. So basic science is fundamental research that's designed to understand the laws and processes that govern brain function. And you might wonder why you would want to do basic science at all, right? You might think, well, in fact, it might be, it's kind of counterintuitive counterintuitive. If you want to understand mental disorders, well, maybe you should study them specifically and not just try and focus on how the brain works in its normal state. Um, and I think that's true. Clinically directed work is, of course, incredibly important. But basic science plays a really, really big role as well. And to make that really clear, let me give a couple of examples that are outside of neuroscience, um, scientific discoveries that were really basic science findings that turned out to be unbelievably important for medical research. And the first one uh, is the light microscope. So when the light microscope was first uh, invented and then further developed um, by Hooke and others in the uh, late 1500s, early 1600s, it was really a curiosity. So the book of Hooke's that made the microscope really famous called Micrographia was a book that showed um, very close-up drawings that he made of insects that he looked at under his microscope. So 
he would not have been funded to solve any major clinical problems because at that point, nobody knew that using a microscope would be important to understanding anything relevant to medicine. But of course, these days, we know it's absolutely essential. It lets us look at cells and healthy cells and cancer cells and neurons, and that without microscopes, medical progress would be nowhere near what it was today. But at the time, it was really a basic science advance, and he did it for the, for, to gain a deeper appreciation of fundamental scientific principles. And it was only later that it was realized how important it was uh, for medicine. And the same is true, I think, of many of the early discoveries about DNA. People didn't realize originally that genetics would be so important in terms of understanding uh, different kinds of medical disorders, although we know now that it's fundamental. So I think with basic research, it isn't always obvious where it's going to go, and we don't know which basic science findings are going to be most important from a clinical point of view, but really, um, uh, many, many, of them, many of them turn out to be. I should also point out that in basic science, a lot of the work that we do uh, is on animal models. So one challenge of neuroscience is we want to understand the human brain, but we don't always have access to human brains because of ethical reasons we do a lot of experiments on animals. And that, again, might give you pause. You might say, well, wait a minute. If you're interested in understanding autism or schizophrenia, can you really learn anything by studying an animal, especially a rat or a mouse or a fly? And the, the rodents and, and Drosophila, the uh, fruit flies, are really a big, big model organisms and are the focus of a lot of research at Cold Spring Harbor. And the answer is kind of yes and no. I mean, ultimately, a disorder like schizophrenia includes uh, aspects that could be uniquely human. The same is true of autism spectrum disorder. For example, um, a language deficit or dis uh, language disruption is one of the key features of autism. And that's going to be something, of course, we can't study in an animal model because animals, animals don't have language. But despite that, we really have a lot to learn from animals. And there are many aspects of the brain structure and function that are conserved all the way up from uh, rodents to non-human primates and all the way um, to, to humans as well. And in my lab, we've really seen evidence of this firsthand. So when I came here and wanted to study cognitive processes like decision making using rodents, I wanted to be sure that we weren't studying some kind of funny behavior that was idiosyncratic to rodents. I wanted to study behaviors that were common across many different kinds of species. So as I was building my lab, every time we developed a behavioral paradigm for rodents to learn, we developed the same one in parallel for humans to learn. So we made a human version of every paradigm that we made for the rodents. And this allowed us to compare side by side the behavior of the animals. And using different kinds of models to interpret the data, this allowed us to look at very subtle aspects of the strategies used by the humans and the rodents and to compare those two to see how different or similar they were. And one of the things that we observed, and this was one of the first findings I made while well, coming here at Cold Spring Harbor, is that uh, rodents and humans use very, very similar strategies when they're putting together different kinds of pieces of information to make a decision. And when we ran an experiment and looked at the kinds of strategies people used, we replicated earlier results that humans uh, combine information according to what's called a maximum likelihood strategy. It's a sophisticated mathematical strategy that allows you get to get as much information as possible out of the stimulus and make the best choice. And at the time, people were really skeptical that this was a good idea to do this in rodents. They would say, okay, and I'm sure your rodents are really smart, but... <laughs> <laughs> maximum likelihood Q combination in a rat? You, come on. But, but we persevered uh, despite the skepticism, and we were totally right. They absolutely use maximum likelihood Q combination, and the way that they put pieces of information together is very similar to humans. And this doesn't tell us that rats and human brains are the same. They're not. Our brains are much more sophisticated. But there may be computations that are common across many different species, and that by studying them in the rodent, we can learn principles about neural circuits that will be relevant across, uh, across many different species. Um, so one of the reasons I think this is an exciting time in the field of neuroscience is that the kinds of tools that we have available to us to really probe those computations and uncover the neural circuits that drive them um, is advancing at a really fast stage. There's a lot of new tools available that allow us to measure neurons in much more precise ways than we've done before, and also to manipulate small populations of neurons in a very targeted way that can allow us to gain insight into what those neural circuits are doing. And we can do a lot of these kinds of experimental techniques in animals that are awake and behaving and making decisions. And so we can learn about truly complex behavior uh, and its neural underpinnings in a way that's never been, um, that's never been possible before. And 
I think Cold Spring Harbor is really at the forefront of this effort. This is a place that's been a leader in adopting and developing new techniques to measure and, uh, and manipulate neural circuits. The research of my colleagues uh, is, I think, really exciting. There are people that, like I am that are working on basic science problems, and also people uh, like Bo Lee and Pavel Austin who have more of a um, translational approach are interested both in the basic function of the brain and also how it's disrupted uh, in autism and depression and a number um, of, of other disorders as well. So Cold Spring Harbor is really at the forefront and the leading edge of the developments that are happening in neuroscience today that have a chance to surmount some of these challenges. So I hope that if you remember one thing from what I've told you today, it's that understanding the brain in both states, both the normal state and the disrupted state, is really one of the key scientific challenges uh, that we're facing today. And I hope that it's clear that the research, because of the research that we're doing here at Cold Spring Harbor and, and other places as well, that surmounting that challenge is really finally within our grasp. We finally have the tools to start to understand the brain in a way that's really desperately needed. And of course, much of that progress takes place within the laboratory at the hands of the people that are doing the experiments, and especially the students and postdocs who are really critical to that effort. I think, though, that there's a really important role for non-scientists to play as well. So the su public support of science is absolutely key in shaping the public policy. Voters have a huge impact uh, in, in who they vote for, in supporting candidates that will support science. And also individuals who make contributions to science have played a key role and continue to play a key role in making it possible to do the kind of high risk cutting edge research that has the potential to make a big payoff and really can't be done in, in any other means. So at Cold Spring Harbor, we're really grateful for that kind of support and it's, it's allowed us and, and really me personally to take my science in a new direction that I think will be really important. And I think finally, there's a role that an individual can, citizen can play on kind of a more private way. And that is in, in talking to people that you know, your friends and your family, about what an important problem neuroscience is and also what a really interesting problem it is as well. And so I hope that you will, will you know, maybe take the illusions home with you and show them to your, to your friends and to your family and convey to them what a fascinating problem the brain is and how exciting it is to be at a moment where we are finally able to face some of the challenges that, have been, uh, that scientists have been trying to overcome for a long time. So thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Yeah, so she wanted to know what was the experiment we did to show that rats were using the same strategy as humans. So yeah, it's a good question. So what we did is we have um, a situation where animals need to make a judgment about the rate. It's either a flicker or a series of clicks of a stimulus. So the rat goes into a little box and he's presented with flashing lights and some clicking uh, sounds. And the rat has to report whether those clicks are high or low compared to a memorized standard. And so the rats typically do better when they have multi-sensory information. We call this multi-sensory enhancement. And it's, in fact, a very general feature um, of really all animals. And in, it, many of you may be able to use this in, in uh, teaching small children or even your partners uh, to do things you want them to. If, <laughs> if you can see and hear something, it's way, way better than just seeing it or just hearing it. And so multi-sensory enhancement had been known for a long time. So it, wasn't, um, it, was, it was encouraging, but not a huge surprise that, that rats show multi-sensory enhancement. But here's the cool part. So when humans put together multi-sensory information, they don't just throw the auditory and visual cues together willy-nilly, they do it in a really smart way. So the brain has a way of figuring out on a very fast time scale which modality is better. Okay, so if you're talking on uh, your, uh, or your, I guess if you're talking to someone in a crowded room, the auditory signal isn't very good, so you'll make more use of your visual system. You'll pay attention to their gestures and their lip movements and so on, and the reverse is true when the visual signal is worse. And humans are able to weight, change the weight of each cue in this statistically optimal way on a very fast time scale. And that's what we showed with the rats. So moment by moment, we would change it so that the flashes were very reliable, very bright and easy to see, or then on the next trial, they would be very very dim and hard to see, and we found that the rats were able to change the way that they weighted each stimulus in agreement with the maximum likelihood model. How did the rat tell you? <laughs> yeah. That's the challenge of working with animals. 
Yeah, so that that's the challenge. So we have to get a way to report for them to report the choice. Oh yeah, she asked, how do we get animals to tell us their decision? Um, yeah, so what we do is we train them. We start first with very easy stimuli, so nothing ambiguous, no integration over anything, and we just train them with experience. If you experience a high rate, go to a little left port, and if you experience a low rate, go the other direction. And every time they do it right, we give them a drop of water. And so the students and postdocs in the lab work really, really hard to teach the animals this principle. And so they, every day they bring the rat, they put it into, into a box that we have for them to go into, and they have lots and lots of opportunities to learn this relationship. And once they've learned the relationship, then they know it, and then we can use really interesting stimuli like ones where it's not exactly high or not exactly low or somewhere in the middle or maybe has multiple modalities, and then, then we can really gain insight into more complex decisions after that. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you that it's still a big problem that there are many fewer women in science um, than than uh, men, even in biology. And it's interesting. I um, I run uh, co-direct the undergraduate research program that we have here at Cold Spring Harbor, and we get really incredibly talented people that come from all around the country to our to our program. And it's always kind of interesting for me to sit in the at the, symp the symposium they do at the end of the summer, because there's there are equal numbers of men and women that apply. Usually more slightly more women apply, and the students are just all so unbelievably impressive. They're just amazing, and they are all so excited and passionate about science. And it's very strange to go to that situation which is completely equal in terms of male and female uh, students who you know are aspiring scientists and then to go to a meeting in my own field where you know sometimes I'm the only female speaker <laughs> in the whole meeting and so there's a great interest in uh, young women in science it seems to persist all the way to the undergraduate level but then something happens between then that such that many women kind of leak out of the pipeline and don't make it to the um, to the senior professor level I th I think it's a really complex problem, and I, I don't really have a, a short answer. Part of it is that, that women b bear more of the responsibility of childbearing, but that isn't the whole effect. When you control for that, there's still a difference. So women who don't have children are still at a disadvantage relative to men. So I don't know. We can maybe talk offline. I think I, I think that the key thing is to really set up situations that are supportive for, for female scientists. And in, in terms of children, I think one of the things that's really important is to make it possible for women to have children and do science at the same time. And one of the things uh, at Cold Spring Harbor that's been really fundamental from that is the, um, the Mary Lindsay daycare that we have here. And I can say on a personal level, when I came to, yeah, big hand. <laughs> I know I'm giving a long answer to your question, but I just I want to say that this uh, this one thing in support of the daycare. So before I was hired here as faculty, I came out for a short visit that was about a month and a half in the summer, and my kids then were um, three and five, and. I wouldn't. I would not have been able to come if it weren't for the daycare, because I would have had nowhere that they could go. And it was only because it was possible for them to be in the daycare when I was working in the lab that I was able to come here. And then that ultimately led, you know, to, to us all realizing that I could potentially fit here as a faculty member. And so having that daycare just completely, it really changed the trajectory of my life. It really did. So little things, uh, things like that are hugely important. So yeah. I haven't seen it, no.
Yeah, so she's asking about difference in brain architecture between uh, males and females. And there are, there are definitely big differences, and they're, um, they're present from very early on, because the hormones that a baby experiences, even in utero, are very different, have a differing effect on male and female brains. In fact, our uh, incoming faculty, new faculty member, Jessica Tolkun, really focuses her research on how those hormones affect brain development. So it's a really interesting, um, it's a really interesting topic. And they have profound effects for mental illness. So men and women are, are susceptible in different degrees to different kinds of mental illness, but for example, boys are more likely to get autism. Women are more likely to suffer from depression. And even within a particular kind of mental illness, the trajectories can be different. So for example, schizophrenia, the, the peak risk age for males is a bit earlier than it is um, for females. So it's really essential in developing the right understanding of the disorders and the right treatment to take into account that, that male and female brains are different. Yeah, so I agree. That's a big challenge of using rodent models of disease in order to understand those neural circuits. Because uh, you, in, in my lab, for example, we've been studying a mouse model of autism, the 16P deletion model that was developed by Aaliyah Mills lab here uh, at Cold Spring Harbor. And it would be a mistake to say that this mouse has autism, right? There are aspects of that disorder um, that are very uniquely human and can't be replicated in a mouse. And then there are also aspects of that disorder that, that, that may have an, a counterpart in mice, but that will look very different. For example, a, a an unusual social interaction will look very different in mouse uh, and in humans. And so I think the strength of using those disease models is as follows. It might be that a genetic disruption like the 16P, which is a large uh, chromosomal deletion, leads to changes in neural circuits that are similar in both mice and in humans. So if one, just sort of an intuitive example, maybe in both cases, things change such that the same kind of sensory input is, has a different gain in the disease model versus the, um, versus the typical, typically developing model. Model. And so by understanding how those uh, diseases affect neural circuits, we might gain insight into the circuit disruptions that are taking place in humans. But again, I think developing the right behavioral task is key, and I think rodent behavioral tasks has traditionally been rather crude, and I think the field is starting to really evolve and can do much better in terms of developing um, behaviors for animals that will expose interesting differences between normal and, and disrupted animals. That's a really interesting question about the infants. Uh, yeah, I don't know about the tra developmental trajectory of the blind spot because it would be a difficult thing to measure um, in infants right because like you couldn't do the certain sort of test that you do in adults the way they measure a lot of these abilities in infants is things like preferential looking times where they're allowed to kind of move their head and look at one thing or another and those head movements would make it difficult to measure so it's a really interesting question she i should have repeated that she was wondering about infants and and uh and and blind spots so yeah i think it would be difficult to measure in terms of adults i don't know whether it would be right to think about it being the, the best thing to do to try and to try and not fill in those gaps. I think part of what makes our brains work efficiently is that we're filling in gaps all the time and we make use of what you might call kind of our priors about the nature of the world to be able to navigate it efficiently. So here's one example for, uh, for instance, when we walk on stairs, we have a really strong prior belief about what the height of those stairs should be so that we um, set our movement up absolutely exactly. And so that you will use just as little energy as you possibly have to to go from one step to the next. And in fact, if you change stair height just a little bit, like you make them a centimeter taller or shorter than they usually are, people trip all over the place because they really, really expect them to be a certain height. And so uh, our brains put in a lot of effort towards making things easy. And uh, yeah, it's, it would be difficult to overcome that. <laughs> 
Yeah, so she's wondering about plasticity in adults and whether it's possible to measure plasticity. And yeah, absolutely. So what, I'll just highlight one kind of area of research about plasticity in adults that's been really interesting. So there's a childhood vision disorder um, called amblyopia, which means you have an eye that you can't focus at any depth. It's often caused by strabismus, which is when your eyes are not, not aligned. Um, and amblyopia has typically thought that you can only treat it up till about five, six, seven years of age. But they've realized lately um, uh, some work by Daphne Bavelier, who's at University of Geneva, that it's possible for adults to uh, gain a lot of function even if they've had amblyopia their whole lives and the stimulus that they use to train the adults to use their eye are uh, video games so they play video games where they are especially these they're called first person shooter video games where they're navigating around buildings they're the kind none of us like but they're really they we try to get our sons not to play them they're really effective um, in treating in treating uh, adult vision so yeah typically a behavioral measure is probably the best one Um, yeah, it, it sort of depends what it means. I, I mean, sometimes when they say not tested on animals, it means just that they're using formulas that are known to be safe um, because other people tested them on animals. So it, it's not clear what the what the, the net effect is. I, I think it's a, it's a tricky issue because, of course, we, we want to make sure that animals are never harmed unnecessarily. And, you know, I like animals and, and using them in the lab. It's really um, a great responsibility and one that we want to be really careful of to, to do to do with care. Um, but at the same time, that kind of research in science is really necessary. And even outside of science can be really beneficial as well. There, there are household products that used to be really, really dangerous um, and, and children would sometimes consume them and get really sick um, that now are much better. People have come up with safer formulas for a lot of things. So um, I think it depends. Anyway, thank you, uh, Anne, very much for a fantastic talk.